welcome to another episode of the Small Gold Subscribers Sound Off series. And today I'm delighted to have with me Carl Joseph DeMarco, author, and some of you may know him as Thorny Bastard on Twitter. Senor DeMarco, how are you today? Hey, ciao. Come stai? Molto bene, <laughs> molto bene. Okay, allora, uh, aspettiamo un, un attimo. Okay, so today we're going to talk about <laughs> Mr. DeMarco's background and how he got interested in precious metals. And we're going to also take a look at a couple of his very interesting books that I haven't had a chance to read, but he's going to give us a preview on what's going on there. He's also involved in some precious metals and blockchain, Bitcoin projects as well. So let's get started. Mr. DeMarco, how did you come about to become interested in all the topics that the small gold subscribers and I follow on a daily basis, i.e. gold, silver, cryptocurrencies, economics, a little splash of politics? How did you come about becoming interested in alternative uh, investments like gold, silver, and cryptocurrencies? It's funny you should mention that because... I don't really know. However, I can zero in on a particular event. When I was getting ready to come home to the States on a vacation from China. Uh, as, as, as you but your listeners may not know, uh, I, I was running a business in China for almost 15 years. Uh, it was basically a language training and communications training company and uh around 2011 or 2012 i was preparing to come home for a summer vacation and i don't know why but i was looking up something on the internet that some bit of information i needed for that trip and for some reason up on my screen pops this little price chart on gold and silver and i notice it and I thought, whoa, look at that. Gold's down to like 1400 It must be a good time to buy. And I suddenly just got this interest in precious metals, looking at that little graph. Because it was up, uh, it was over $2,000 at one time, I think, right? In 2011, I, it peaked at 1911. That's right. 19, there you go. Okay, 1911. All right. So, uh, and, I, and I remember some friends in China suggesting I buy. It was actually foreigners, not, not Chinese people. But I was thinking, no, no, it's like $1,900, $2,000 now. It's not a good time to buy because they were buying a lot of it. But uh, I, I didn't want to. And then I was making this trip home, I guess, several months after that. And I noticed the price was down around 14 And uh, when I got home, I made my first purchase from a company that doesn't exist anymore in Texas. And I think they kind of crashed and burned in an ignominious fashion. Uh, oh, I can't remember the name of that company now. Uh, something Bullion or oh, Bullion Direct. Bullion yes, Direct. yes. There was a couple yes. of them that went out of business because they were basically hedging the money that you sent them and not necessarily delivering you the metals right away hoping that they right. could do something with the float. Well, I never had a problem with them, but I didn't like their uh, shipping and handling charge, and I, I quit using them after a while. But, of course, that got me tracking these these things carefully and looking at YouTube videos, and then I found that whole world of, uh, I, I guess, you know, most people would call them gold bugs. It's uh, sound money advocates might be a nicer word. And people know a lot of the names associated with that. You know, there's Rob Kirby, there's Mike Maloney, and people like that. They put out a whole lot of videos. And um, uh, Peter Schiff is another. I think people would know he's famous for his 2008 crash call that that nobody else was was predicting. So uh, I think after that, he he earned garnered a lot of respect for that call. So uh, I started following all these people and learning. So many things I I didn't know, right? Uh, before that, I was kind of, you know, uh, who cares about politics and finance? It's just a world full of headaches. Uh, there's people who do that. I'm going to, I can have more fun doing other things. And it actually became kind of a hobby for me, you know? And 
I, I started with that world of, I guess, uh, libertarian sound money advocates, and I used that as a launch point into other areas of research and would just follow threads here and follow threads there and uh, joined uh, discussion forums here and message boards there and um, woke up to a lot of things that I, I had no idea were going on. I mean, I grew up in D.C., so I, I, I did see the sausage being made. You know, <laughs> I, I worked for the government. I worked on the Hill and uh, decided to get the heck out of Dodge. But, uh, you know, um, there's still there were things that you don't see even from that perspective, you know. And it was very eye-opening. And I think that's how I got into the... Uh, uh, the, the the fields of interest of your of small gold listeners and fans. Okay, and then from that point, we've had some of our listeners tell us that they started to feel like they had been awakened, that they had learned things they had never learned before, and then many of them said then they went on autopilot. They just turned in, tuned in to these shows, and were told incessantly that the dollar was destined to collapse and that gold and silver were destined to skyrocket. And they waited and they waited and they waited through years of these predictions. And I remember distinctly Mark Battaglia, one of our subscribers, gave an interview with me. He then said at one point he realized, wait a minute, what's going wrong here? And I had the similar thought. And that's one of the main reasons I started the channel. I said, why aren't these predictions coming true? What's going on? I think you had a similar, I don't want to call it maybe an awakening on top of an awakening. Did you go through that as well? Oh, I think just about everybody goes through that who's on this track. Uh, but first of all, compliments for all the paisans on your show. Uh, Batalia <laughs> sounds yeah, sounds like another paisan. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got a little, <laughs> we've got a little group here. It's probably the only one on, we do. on YouTube. We do. Right. You know, we, we, we need to work on that reputation, don't we? Where most of us are honest, hardworking people. That's right. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think everybody goes through that phase on this track where you get into the fear mongering, you know, and I don't want to discredit any of those people necessarily because there is a lot of truth in what they're saying. There's an underlying foundation in their commentary that rings true, but they're missing part of the picture. You know, some of these people, maybe they just get stuck in the fear mongering. Others of them maybe are making a good living at it and uh, have found their niche market and want to keep it going. Uh, others of them may be pitching products associated with it. Uh, so there's different reasons, I think, why so many of the commentators out there are, are selling the fear. But uh, intelligent people, rational people, when they listen long enough and deeply enough and continue in various lines of research, there's no way you can stay with it unconditionally, you know? Because uh, the dollar hasn't collapsed. The Chinese haven't taken over the world. The Russians haven't, uh, you know, uh, conquered the, the oil and the LNG markets. Uh, you know, whatever the, the flavor of the, the month or the week is for, for that, I guess, uh, for that industry of, of fear mongering. It, it just never seems to quite come to pass. You know, the, nobody is dumping their treasuries. And I think you were talking about that the other night, weren't you? One of the big things was, oh, all this, this or that country has to do is dump all their treasuries in the U.S. as toast. Well, n nobody does that, though. That's the problem. Yeah, if they did, yeah, but... But they don't, and that, that's, the, that's the reality of it. Even last night, if you missed last night, I talked about even if someone, or did, and Russia pretty much did, they dumped half their treasuries, that's only like $45 billion, and that's like a half a month of QE, and it's less than, <laughs> it's less than Apple has in uh, U.S. treasuries. It's less than right. Google has. So, again, that's where I, I started following this stuff, and I started thinking even if everything they're saying is true, do the consequences from what they're saying might happen really follow from what they're saying is going to happen? Right. 
Well, so in the case of Russia, anyway, you can see that that it didn't, obviously, right? Right. In fact, the the U.S. dollar is quite strong right now, and and the yuan just got devalued. So where's that going? <laughs> and that's in the light of the petro yuan and the gold back yuan, all these things. That oh were yeah, gonna, they yeah. were going to happen. No, I, bought, and... I bought into that for a long time. You know, I was living there in China, and I in in the south of China, you know, a subtropical climate, and I'm thinking. Boy, did I make the right choice? You know, I'm. This is the going to be the king of economies in a few years, and uh, I don't have to worry about any ice ages or bad weather coming because I'm like sitting right here, perfectly situated climatically. And boy, was I a accidental genius, you know. But uh... <laughs> well, now that you mentioned China, it's a good segue. What I wanted to talk about is a lot of times people tell you what China is doing, never having been there. Uh, what China's going to do based on what they heard on YouTube, not from any speech that they heard, or maybe they've, they've taken a line out of a speech out of context. But a lot of times I hear, and the numbers do bear out that there's high gold demand in China, uh, uh, retail demand, and also I get the Shanghai Gold Exchange numbers. But the mentality I get from listening to some of the gold channels is, that the Chinese people are head over heels over gold. There's a gold shop on every corner and that the Chinese wake up every day looking to make their next gold purchase. Now you spent time in China. Can you tell us if you ran across that and you probably, if you weren't looking for it and you didn't see it, that's a good indication that it doesn't exist. If you were looking for it and you saw it, it's a good indication that that's partially true. Or if you're not paying attention, it doesn't mean anything. So tell us what your experience was if you were paying attention to what people in China, Chinese people, you said you mentioned you had some mm -hmm. expat friends that were buying gold. What was their view towards gold or silver if they even had one? Uh, I think uh, the, the friends that I was talking about, it was a, it was a mixed couple, an uh, American guy with a, and a Chinese wife. And they saw gold as a store of value. Now, I always wondered if that's the case, why were they buying overpriced trinkets instead of just plain bullion? <laughs> but, you know, because you can go into these shops in China and buy these beautifully cast, uh, elaborate uh, Buddha statues or, you know, Guan Yin riding on a cloud and things like this. And uh, you're paying a lot more more than the weight of gold when you buy those things and, and that's what they would buy and they also bought a lot of a lot of bling that they would wear and I, I didn't understand that if you're trying to get a store of value you want to minimize what you pay for it and just get bars or coins do right? you think they're actually trying to store their value or they were just trying to show off their wealth uh probably a little of both okay yeah uh this friend of mine that i'm talking about he's a pretty sensible guy uh, especially financially. So the, the show off might have been because his wife liked to do those kinds of things and the store of value might have been because he understood that, you know, precious metals uh, in the long term will retain their value. So uh, probably a combination uh, from each half of the marriage there. Um, but I didn't really know any locals that were doing that. And I knew thousands of locals because right. I'd be in front of them doing communications and language training every day. And very few of them thought that, uh, they didn't think it was a waste of money to buy gold and silver, but it's not something that they were into. You know, you gotta understand with the prosperity that is coming to the new Chinese middle class, those people are not looking to hoard gold in their basements. They're looking to experience a life that their parents couldn't have. And that right. means traveling abroad and owning a car and buying a house, you know? So I would say the number one store of value for your everyday Chinese person with uh, uh, surplus income is buying a house. That's number one, okay? And I would say number two is buying a car. And number three is traveling overseas. And then maybe number four might be some precious metals investment. Well, you know, that dovetails into this. is I was just suspecting, but that in China and India, your gold demand isn't because they're worried about collapse, like 
they try to tell people in the U.S. you need to buy gold or silver to prepare that yourself. Never, that, that, that never enters their minds. Right. And in, in fact, fact, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, practically everybody I talk to, even party members, if they could, they would live in America because they thought it was much better economically off than China is. And they're more worried about something happening in China than in the U.S., but it's not the closest thing to their mind on any uh, by by is it's not third or fourth you know it, it it comes up in conversation if you mention it but no no they're not they're not at all worried about that that's okay. not why anybody's buying in fact i'll tell you something else i i used to go into a lot of retail coin shops uh in china and it's a very different experience than in the states because in the states people are all looking mostly for like uh 10 ounce bars or sovereign coins, you know, uh, maples, eagles, and uh, what are those ones that come from uh, Austria? Philharmonics, yeah. Philharmonics, yeah, the Philharmonics, right. That, that's what people are looking for. And if they're, if they're real budget stackers, they're looking for uh, budget rounds, things that are 49 to 75 cents over spot, right? But in China, no. You go in there, it's a completely different sort of selection of items. For one thing, they're much more culturally based in the East. So the you're getting like big five ounce rounds of Chinese mythological scenes that are elaborately done. Mm. Uh, you're getting uh, preset collections that are framed and matted, you know, things like this. You're getting the... Um, the, the Chinese style ingots that are shaped like a hat. You know, people might have seen pictures of those on the internet. And the premiums are humongous. Uh, if, when, when you can find like uh, Perth Mint stuff or uh, um, uh, Royal Canadian Mint stuff, the premiums are, I would say, a hundred percent on that stuff. So if you think spot price right now is sixty bucks, if you want to buy a one ounce Canadian silver maple in China, expect to pay at least thirty five dollars for it for one ounce. <clears throat> now, what about those other ones? It sounds like they're more collector based and more numismatic, which would say that's not as much of an investment. It's more of a um... Again, a luxury item. They have some money. They're going to buy absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You go into like uh, Bank of China or ICBC <clears throat> to one of the wealth management seminars. And what it really is, is a precious metals sale where people are selling high end bowls, chopsticks, uh, commemoratives, things like this at jacked up prices. So you're, you're going to be paying uh, double or triple spot price for those items. Yeah, they call it a wealth management seminar, but really right. it's over price precious metals. Uh, well, and and you know, that ties into, I, I know a lot of our listeners are bought into the collapse and that their gold and silver will rise because of collapse. But you're making a point that I made without real experience other than just knowing the numbers, uh, that you, you can have a lot of gold demand when there's wealth being created. And it sounds like the Chinese are not buying for the same investment reasons they're buying because they can because they have money and it's not because you know i hear the chinese are smart they understand gold no they just have more money now isn't that the case and they like the way it looks and they can afford it so they buy it it doesn't sound like they're preparing for the collapse uh no not at all in fact i think what what they're really doing is uh buying heirlooms, things that will stay in the family for generations. Yes. That's what I think they're buying right. when they get into precious metals. You know, these the yes. Buddha statues I mentioned, the the silver chopsticks, you know, the commemoratives. That's that's really what they're looking for. And that's what India uh, does, right? That's what Indians have been doing. That's the wearable wealth, the heirlooms, the gifts for the weddings, to give to your daughter, your granddaughter. They're not stackers in the same way that you have in America. <laughs> Hey, I don't know nothing about India. I just do China, man. You just do China. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> now, speaking of China, let's move along now. You, you seem to have written uh, books 
that playoff. I haven't read them. I've read the the, the Amazon uh, blurbs that play off your experience in in China. There's two of them. The first one is China Weird: Ten Thousand Years of Strangeness, and the second one is the Giza Death Star Restored. Can you tell us how you got into uh, writing books and how China factored in? And by the way, if I were to do a word search in any of these two books, would the word gold appear in them? Um, yes, because the Giza Death Star Restores mentions the 330 tons of central bank bullion that disappeared from the Ukraine after the coup in 2014. Interesting. All right. Now, I don't, I've never been able to prove that or validate it in any way, but Jim Willie says, and <laughs> Must be a true. lot of this, yeah, a lot of the stuff he says has a strange way of bearing itself out, out years down the road. I remember listening to one of his interviews in, I don't know, 2013 or something, talking about the U.S. and China being at war in Djibouti over a port, right? <laughs> and I was searching online, obscure sources, everything to find stuff about that, you know, and I couldn't find any kind of validation. And then one day I'm walking down the street uh, at a Shukho port in Shenzhen, and I see this new building where uh, Jupiter paint and coatings used to be, and it says in French, the Djibouti, the, the joint China Djibouti Port Authority building. And I'm like, look at that. The Djibouti Port Authority right here in Shenzhen. And Jim Willie mentioned something about that three or four years ago, you know? So, uh, I, you know, sometimes you got to be patient with these things. You find them out later. But uh, articles popped up here and there about that uh, uh, shortly after I spotted that building. So it's kind of boots on the ground intel there. But Yes, absolutely. Now, these books that you wrote, what had you had any background or any uh, inkling that you wanted to write books when you were younger? Or did this just come about because you felt you had these books in you? based on your experience. I mean, you kind of wrote in your autobiography, you had a somewhat of a vagabond uh, <laughs> life. Uh, and it's all working out. You know, you went where you thought maybe might work out in China. Uh, <laughs> how did you come about to decide, I'm going to sit down and write China Weird? That was actually a dare, you know, uh -huh. a challenge. Um, you know, uh, when I, uh, I, I was working at a Beltway Bandit in the, late 90s and uh i'm I sorry had what, what's some, a beltway bandit a beltway bandit is a consulting firm that makes its money off the federal government ah, i see you're talking dc you know they put out right? a publication <laughs> yeah they, they put out a publication every day called the federal register which lists uh new contracts looking for bids you know things the federal government wants to study or or report on and they farm it out to these consulting agencies and uh, the one I looked for would troll these federal registers looking for projects to bid on. And that, that's pretty much how everybody makes a living in Washington, directly or indirectly. I mean, if you, if you don't work for the government, you work for a consulting company that works for the government. Right. And even if you work for a, a trash collector or a landscaping company or you're a painter or whatever, uh, you're still making money from people who made their living off the government. You know, there's, there's very little uh, original industry here. So <clears throat> I, I, I kind of, I, I had some experiences that just had me throw my hands up and say, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm getting out and uh, took up a life teaching primitive skills, traveling around the country. Uh, some friends of mine and I ran a, uh, summer program for kids out in Illinois. I guided rafts down on the Ocoee River in Tennessee. And uh, yeah, I did things like that. It just kind of gave me this, you know, nice, pure feeling outdoor experience. You know, a friend of mine and I, we built a, uh, uh, a shelter out of sticks and leaves out in the woods just outside D.C. and lived there for a year. Never, nobody ever discovered us, you know. <laughs> That's real so, prepping. You see, you've actually lived the life. You've been in China, and you've actually lived off grid. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but who dared yeah, you to write the book? So anyway, uh, this this show we listen to, it's probably not within the 
uh, venue of most of your listeners. It's the it was called Banal of America. I think his he just finished his tenth season and and closed the show. But around the eighth or ninth season, he was looking for someone to do a paranormal show on China because he'd never covered that in all his years on the air. And my friend and I over there, we both listened to his show and we emailed him and said we would look for somebody over here. But we couldn't find anybody with good enough English or that was willing to speak publicly about that. And so my friend John said to me finally, he said, look, you're a good public speaker. Why don't you do it? You're a, you're, you're a great storyteller, you know. So finally he convinced me. I emailed Tim and said that, we, that I would do his show for him and sent him some material. And I had collected, you know, ghost stories from people I knew locally. I had a couple of my own encounters uh, with things here because I can't come to study. I first went to China in 2002 on a Qigong study tour. You know, that's kind of like an internal martial art energy and chi and things like this. So that kind of fit within the realm of his show. And then I did some research into the old classics, like the old Chinese Bigfoot, which is called Ye Ren, and a kind of Chinese zombie called Zhang Shi, and talked to some locals and things like that about those topics as well, and did a show. And then in the course of that show, he challenged me to write a book and said, if I could, he would have me on the show again. And so I thought, you know, I've always wanted to write a book. Maybe this is the universe telling me it's time. <laughs> so uh, I had just finished a book on speaking English for the Chinese market. And I thought, you know, this is this this would be good. This would be a good one to send home. And so I sat down and wrote it. And I think some of your listeners who have an interest in China would enjoy the book even with the paranormal stuff aside, because there's a lot of observations about daily life in China that puts these stories in a context, you know, because most of these are modern ghost stories that come from students and friends and business associates. And I, I, I wanted the readers here in the States to understand uh, what modern life is like over there. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, they know about Shaolin Kung Fu and they know about Taoism and Sun Tzu. You know, you always talk Sun, about Sun Tzu on the show, right? <laughs> so I wanted to put a, a new spin on it. You know, what are, what, are, you know what, are, what are the attitudes of modern Chinese about these things and what are their experiences with them, you know? So I did that. And there's an, a, a, a rather two extensive sections on Chinese Internet giant Tencent, you know, uh, they were my biggest client while I was over there. I think they were they were a customer of mine for like 10 years. And uh, I, I made a lot of friends there. We had a lot of conversations. And some of them told me ghost stories. And I put that into the context of the modern, uh, you know, working everyday life of these young Chinese who get into the high tech industry. Uh, and, and to show that these are sensible, educated people, you know, and, and, and the values that they have in life as, as, as modern, educated people. So there's a, a lot of information in there about that. Traveling around China, what do you want to, what do you, how do you get to some isolated monastery like Wudong Mountain, you know? Well, there's a three, a very long three sub chapter chapter uh, about that journey and, and, and the things that went on there, you know? So, I think it could be a very illuminating read for uh, some of your listeners. With, All with right, the deep well, we're going to we're going to put a link below, <clears throat> Amazon link. China Weird: Ten Thousand Years of Strangeness. Now, moving on to the second book, which just came out. That book is called The Giza Death Star Restored. What's the topic and the uh, the genesis of that book coming out? Okay, well uh, that. Uh was uh, a thread I picked on uh, as I was getting into this precious metals, real estate, cryptocurrency, uh, real estate, precious metals, economics, cryptocurrencies, and, and finance. And that is the work and research of Joseph P. Farrell, who has done phenomenal digging into the post-war Nazi international and the secret world of finance that enables them to operate and cause mischief around the world. And it's tied in very 
closely. I would say that it, 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 it dovetails or it's intricately related to, inextricably related to his research into alternative science also, because that was a field of tremendous interest to the Nazis, owing to their occult background, as well as their desire to find anything that would help them win the war. And it's an adventure, kind of a swashbuckling story, where a fictitious version of Joseph P. Farrell has to stop the Nazis from restarting the Giza Death Star and taking over the world. You know, it's kind of like one of these, you think of the Death Star in Star Wars, but this one is Earth-based and it's you know, or it's it's based in the uh, in the Giza, the Great Pyramid at Giza, but it it talks a, quite a bit about the the dirty world of black finance that that runs a lot of these operations. Like I said, the 330 tons of gold disappearing from the Ukraine and the uh, neo-Nazi involvement in that coup uh, that that I tie to the to the post-war Nazi international. There are things about the financing that uh, went into uh, uh, 9-11, and I think I touched briefly on Catherine Austin Fitz's work and her discovery of something like $21 trillion missing from the uh, federal budget. And, and uh, that's been validated by a professor out at the University of Michigan or Michigan State, I think, right? So well, where even, does that even money be, go? What does it do? So even I, before I, that, even before that, they did not before nine eleven. There were hearings that they lost like four trillion at the Pentagon. Remember, two trillion, right? Two, two trillion, trillion, right? And then, then all right. of a sudden, it's twenty one trillion. What what a juxtaposition of events, right? The day after that hearing, you have the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. All right. So what I did was uh, take these dots and uh, you know all historical facts, and I wove them into a fictional narrative. And um, Bitcoin actually plays a very big role in that, even though it gets a brief mention in the book, because when this uh, scientifically inclined couple's property is confiscated in Nevada due to one of the experiments they, they pull off out there, it's confiscated by what appears to be a U.S. military uh, organization. They get, in exchange for giving up that property, uh, a large sum of money in exchange for, you know, never talking about it and leaving the United States. Well, their, their money guy puts some of that into Bitcoin. And in the timeline, this is like 2009, 2010. And then, you know, Bitcoin shoots up to $200 in uh, 2011 and, or 2012. And... Their money guy sells it, gets them $20 million, and they're able to fund this operation of um, uh, philanthropic mercenaries to stop the Nazis from uh, restoring the Giza, Giza Death Star and taking over the world. So the, the narrative, while fanciful, uh, incorporates a lot of very real events. And I, I, you know, just to make sure I had it right, I would go in and check historical price charts for Bitcoin. And I would check news articles there. The um, Baghdad Museum heist is mentioned in there. And it's also mentioned uh, Bogdanovich's, or I can't remember his name now. There's a Marine uh, jurist who wrote a brilliant book on the uh, Baghdad Museum heist because he was the guy who was charged with recovering the artifacts. And so all of this, you know, is substantiated uh, in, in history even though the story I tell itself is, is, is fictional. There, there's a statement at the beginning of the book, everything in this book is true except for the story. <laughs> well, you're using, using <laughs> historical things and weaving a fictional account around them. Well, let's move now right. to real life. So the story of that book, not the story of that book, but the title of that book, The Giza Death Star Restored, recommend you get both of them i'm going to check them out they're also available on kindle if you have kindle unlimited there's no charge for those otherwise you'll have to shell out the 349 for them or the 299 for the other one i'll put links below this youtube and bit shoot let's move on to real life bitcoin i understand that you are coincidentally involved in a project of a, another small gold subscriber who is on the you on the small gold subscriber sound off uh, series episode he was talking about he did not give the name of the project but it involved gold and the blockchain 
Do you have an update on that? Anything you can share with us on that project? Yes, I do. Uh, Michael was very brave to go on the air and uh, talk about those things. And now that we're further along, we feel more comfortable uh, revealing more information. But the project is called Furex, F-U-R-E-X, which is kind of a acronym for future exchange. So we just kind of put it into Furex because it sounded cooler, I guess, and more futuristic. But uh, that is a project that is in that that connects peer-to-peer -peer traders, so that people who want to trade their precious metals to get into crypto can meet people with crypto that want to get into precious metals. And there are different reasons why either party would want to do that. Uh, I, for one, before I left China, sold all my, almost all my gold and silver in China and bought Bitcoin uh, before I left. And um, it was still much cheaper than it is now at that time. But uh, so, well, so well, was, that, those... was that because, let's say you had stayed in China, would you have done that or did you do that because it was easier to leave China with the Bitcoin that it would have been to transport the gold and silver? Uh, that is one reason. It was easier to leave with the Bitcoin than with the gold and silver, uh, obviously, right? But I mean, and that, man, that would have made for some heavy luggage. I was already paying for two cats to come over in the baggage compartment. I didn't want to have to pay for, <laughs> you know, so much weight, silver and gold. But so that's one was uh, to get around the, the capital flight limitations also. And then another reason was I was disillusioned with uh, silver and gold as and for in terms of asset appreciation. Hmm. I'm, I'm not disillusioned with them as assets in general. But in, in terms of silver will skyrocket to six hundred dollars, or go wait till you see ten thousand gold or gold. It's just around the corner. I knew that wasn't happening. And you know, it was, disin time. it was disingenuous for people to say that because historically, that's not what gold really does. Other than, well, I guess it does in those those crisis periods. It does that against currencies that get rocked, and then it just basically revalues itself. But normally, gold. Is a is a store of value. It's not meant to get you rich, and they they sold it as well. I guess that's why they sell it. As, they sell it as a way to get rich because they're selling you on the concept that the collapse is always just around the corner, and therefore that's when you're going to get rich. Right, right. Okay, so, so you you moved home, and uh, and uh, so you asked. Uh, so I, I sold the the gold and silver to get Bitcoin, <clears throat> and uh, where. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot what the original question was. Now we, we were we were moving into um, we were talking about Furex. And we were oh, talking... Furex, right? Yeah. So I, I, for one, was one of these people who moved from precious metals into crypto, not completely, but uh, for the majority of my portfolio. And um, so there's different reasons why people want to do this. My reason was to facilitate a move. Okay. And that's actually one of the reasons we cite in our white paper. You know, that, that could be one reason why you want to switch from one to the other, and then you can switch back once your move is accomplished. So what we want to do then is, while these people can meet up and trade with each other, we want to uh, issue the currency through which those trades are conducted, and that would be the Furex token, and there would be no fiat uh, currency involved in the platform. One reason is uh, that uh, it's not universal. You know, you could be in Canada, you could be in China, you could be in Australia or Thailand, you could be in any country, and you're all using different money. So if you have a single currency for that, then everybody's on the same page and valuations are, are easier and more universal. So this Furex token will be the 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 value reference or the the reference of of value for the assets on the exchange. So Bitcoin will be cited in Furex, uh, gold will be cited in Furex. You know, and you can post your trades and see who you connect with, and uh, exchange assets, and um, 
you know, there would be an escrow service that would keep the digital assets safe while the physical trade is accomplished. Well, it sounds like a very interesting project. Now, are you going to offer that? Have you worked out all of your – we know that there is a lot of SEC scrutiny. Some people are not doing their offerings in the U.S., or if they're doing offerings in the U.S., they're doing only – institutional investors have you gotten to the point where you figured out where you're going to offer it and to whom well the first round of fundraising is a saft which is a simple agreement for future tokens and that's a very simple thing to do in the u.s uh with you know being completely compliant with the sec uh it's not expensive to pull off in fact it's uh fairly inexpensive and it's a good way to be in a, a, juris, a, a jurisdiction that's stable. You know, our original right. plan was to do it in China. We were going to use my company in China, and I was going to transfer shares to the other partners. And the weekend we were going to transfer those shares, trying to put the kibosh on everything in, in crypto space. And we kind of had to backpedal a little bit and think, well, let's regroup and figure out how we're going to do this now. And I'm kind of glad that it turned out that way. And I think the other people involved with the project are also because we didn't uh, get this ex post facto enforcement from the Chinese authorities on our project. And we're in a jurisdiction that eschews ex post facto sort of things, right? So um, yeah, so the, the first round will be a SAFT. The second round, uh, I think, will be a limited private ITO, although we haven't reached a final conclusion or a decision on that yet. And then the ITO, we probably will offshore and exclude U.S. citizens and residents uh, to save on expense and just to simplify the whole process. But again, uh, the SEC and the CFTC are uh continually issuing new guidance on cryptocurrency and that may end up not being necessary you know the situation is so fu so much in flux right now that to nail anything down i think would be foolish and unfortunately a lot of people in crypto space are doing that What's some projects it paid off handsomely for like uh populous token fan fantastic brilliant project that launched i think in the uk or the isle of uh white or something like that and uh, they're doing really well now. Uh, but, you know, we had plans for China and that would have screwed us royally. No, I think this so, is all, all quite good because... The this is the other thing about China, the people who follow, you are all enthusiastic about that. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got good friends in China. The, the people there are terrific. Uh, I, I, I've had a lot of wonderful experiences. My plan was to stay for one year and I stayed for 15. <laughs> so, you know, it couldn't it couldn't have been awful. But when you're dealing with the, the, the government there, man, it's it, it's it's what what strikes their fancy, you know? Well, what does strike uh, their fancy? I have a question. You, you, can't, you can't you can't rely on a, on a stable legal environment over there to really do anything. And if you're into I.T., that's all intellectual property, you know, and that's going to get stolen. I'm sorry. That's not a place. You want to be doing you, you want to be running a large company or doing a lot of international trade because everything is going to get stolen from you well that also leads to not trusting the currency and that's why i have problems with people talking about the yuan as being taking over the dollar if you can't trust the numbers you can't trust the the way of doing business or it's just a different way of doing business you can't trust it but before we go i just want to make a comment and get your thoughts on it we've seen now a big drop in the cryptocurrency space uh, Bitcoin a couple of years ago was 70, 80, 90 percent of the market cap of all cryptocurrencies. As Bitcoin went up, we had other coins, we had forks and we had a lot of ICOs. We saw Bitcoin dominance go down. And now I think what you're seeing is a lot of these ICOs, most of them were just cashing in the idea that they were crypto or blockchain. They weren't solid projects. They're going out of business. And I think that leaves more money for the established cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Monero, what have you, but also for some of the more interesting um, ICOs that aren't necessarily currencies, but are using a DAO for uh, their value proposition. And I think I read today there's 800 of these cryptocurrencies slash ICOs that are just completely gone. They're finished. 
where do you see the whole space headed? Is this a pause that refreshes, or is this the end of the of the boom and we're in for a long slog, if anything? Well, <clears throat> to begin with, I think the whole issue of Bitcoin dominance is irrelevant. And I, I don't really think that matters how much of the market share Bitcoin <coughs> has. You know, uh, as more and more projects come online and more and more currencies are issued, uh, of course, Bitcoin is going to suffer in terms of uh, right. market dominance, but that doesn't affect its utility at all. I think it's still a, a, a brilliant, pro one of the, probably the most important uh, new technology uh, this century and for a long time to come. Uh, so uh, you wouldn't have any of those other cryptocurrencies if it had not been for Bitcoin, right? right? And we may see a shift in Bitcoin to becoming more of a store of value and large trade settlement uh, uh, currency and see some of the other, uh, say, purpose-built tokens and smaller players in the market being used for more everyday or smaller scale uh trade exchanges. Uh, Litecoin, for example, is really good for small purchases, buying your cup of coffee or placing an online order for, you know, your, your books or your clothes or something like that. Uh, some of the others uh, like Dash and Monero are very good also for online commerce, e-commerce. And then you have your purpose-built stuff, which you need to operate smart contracts. And I think that's a great thing to come along because you limit the complications that actual human lawyers bring into right. fairly simple situations. And the cheating that goes on with that sometimes, just because you happen to have the ability to sue and the other person doesn't or vice versa, I was involved in a case there where the contract allowed me to get out of the contract, but because the builder had a lawyer on re retention, they were able to force me into a settlement, and it should have been under a smart contract, would have been automatic, they didn't perform, I would have gotten my money back. So that I'm looking forward to the day when a contract says what it says, and your enforcement rights aren't tied to whether you have the resources to, to, uh, <laughs> to get them. Well, this is how they get people on patents too, isn't it? You yes. know, some big company with a lot of resources comes along and knows they can steal a patent because uh, Joe Blow can't can't afford the legal fees to fight them in court for five years. Right, right, right. And so, putting these patents on the blockchain with a purpose-built token will eliminate that kind of fraud. Yeah, I, I and, think people uh, people don't realize it. The people that just say all cryptocurrencies are going to zero and they're a fraud, I don't think they've looked into it enough. They they just have it in their head. They're no good, but we'll save that for another time. Carl Joseph DeMarco, thank you very much for joining me. Hope to have you back on the show. And uh, are you writing another book or are you done for now? Uh... I think I'm done for now, but I feel like there's going to be a sequel to The Giza Death Star Restored. All right. Well, when you get that in progress, let us know, and we'll have you back, and we'll keep up the conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. And where can our listeners find you? We're going to put the links to the books below. What else should we tell our listeners where to find you? Okay. Well, uh, they can follow me on Twitter, at ThornyBastard1. So that's another place you can look for me. Uh, or you can, if you're interested in the book side of things, you can email me at, let me make sure I have this correct, uh, China Weird at, I have to check this because it's a little funky, China Weird at use, use dot, startmail.com if you're interested in Furex you can reach me at cj.demarco at furex.io alright and just remember that the this is and not a you can go to furex.io 
and uh, put your email in there if you want to subscribe. All right. We're going to make the disclaimer here that this is not a solicitation to buy or sell any particular security. This is for informational purposes if you want to get in touch with uh, Carl Joseph DeMarco Correct. regarding Furyk. All right. I'd like to put in one, one more plug, if I may, for you, Lewis, because I spent 15 years in China, and I've heard and read the commentary from a lot of different people, and there's really only two people whose analysis – I really like and agree with, uh, at least in terms of the big picture. Maybe your predictions are not only always correct, but your analysis is really sharp. You're one of those two guys, and I think people who really want to know what's going on with China should spend more time listening to Louis Camarasano. Well, thank you very much, Carl Joseph DeMarco. We're going to be listening to you again shortly. We'll have you back on the show. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you, Louis. Take care and stay cool.